next speaker is Linda Mason from Purdue. And All right. So we're going to continue with identification so that we can focus a little bit on corn and review what we need to on corn. So why do we worry about this? And mainly it's because we want to maintain that profitability because there are some control strategies that won't work. So uh, Frank talked about the difference between residuals and fumigants and that these are different products. And we have to remember that residuals are going to be used to treat either the bin itself or the outside of the kernel. Um, they're not going to penetrate in and soak into the kernel compared to a fumigant, which isn't going to coat the kernel, which is why we use it, but it's going to penetrate into the kernel and kill the insect from within. So we have to understand which pests we're going after so that we apply the right strategy. So the uh, main ones that we would want to fumigate for are the internal festers. That's not to say, of course, that the fumigants won't kill everything that's in the grain bin. It will. But the only way to reduce the population of your internal infestors is that fumigation, uh, because you're going to then target the developing insect within the kernel, and the gas then can penetrate in and kill that. If you rely on residuals to kill your internal infestors, you have to wait until the adult has emerged, crawls out, gets coated with the insecticide, then dies. Well, by that time, that one kernel that it came out of is already damaged. And at times, it can lay eggs, continue to lay eggs, until it dies. Depends how long it takes to get enough of that residual insecticide on it to drop it down. So we must understand the difference between an internal and an external pest. Now, the ones that Tom already mentioned earlier on, like the lesser grain borer, as he said, that's primarily for wheat. We rarely see this in corn pests. All right? So it's not one of concern unless a bin has stored wheat in it. And we've emptied that bin. And then we go ahead and put corn in that bin. Then we may see lesser grain borers. They're not happy on corn, but boy, they'll eat it if they have to. The weevils that he mentioned, the rice and the maize weevil, yes, maize weevil is the primary one that we get. And does it really matter which one when you get weevils? Probably not, although um, they do have slight differences in behaviors. But for our purposes and intent today, let's just say a weevil is a weevil. And those are internal pests, as Tom mentioned. We do not want to wait until they get um, out of control because it's a hidden pest. When you find one in a trap, there's probably hundreds hidden still within the kernels as immatures because that's where they're hiding out and you can't sample them. All right. Another one that we get in corn that we would rarely get in wheat is angamoy grain moth. Now, a moth as an internal fester is a really hard one for people often to get their head around because the moth isn't internally developing within the um, kernels. It's the immature. And just like the lesser grain borer, where the eggs are laid on the outside, that immature little caterpillar crawls back in to the kernel and chews and lives within that kernel. So it is hidden from all our residual treatments that we might apply. Um, Angamoy grain moth then emerges as a moth. And typically, it tends to prefer to be toward the top of the bin, because if you're flying around like a moth likes to do, it's hard to do that deep down within a grain bin. So they tend to be more of a pest at, toward the top of the grain bin, unless that grain's been mixed at some point, or on when we're so storing corn on the cob. All right. So those are the three pests that we have to worry about to fumigate for. The only way to get very good control of these pests tends to be with our fumigants, so that we can knock those populations down <laughs> and take care of those immature insects. <coughs> now, everything else to get into the bin are external pests, right? These are all the little beetles that we find that just get in and we find when we do sampling. They're really easier to sample. <coughs> The number one 
that we have with corn, by far just as wheat, India meal moth. This is an insect that when you lower down your grain, and you find grain stuck to the side of a grain bin, behind every one of those little kernels is an Indian meal moth. They form this webbing, as does the angmoid grain moth at times. But the immature forms this webbing. Everyone likes to eat everybody else in a grain bin, and the little larvae want to protect themselves. So they pull kernels together with that webbing, it allows them to protect themselves as they're crawling around trying to eat the corn. When we draw down the grain, that webbing sticks those kernels together, as you can see here on the grain bin, and that's full evidence that you've had an Indian mill moth infestation if you've not noticed it previously. Other two that are important in corn are the sawtooth grain beetle and the red and confused flower beetle. Sawtooth grain beetle is one that we particularly do not want in corn that's going into the feed market or the human food consumption market. And this is because those little saw teeth that you see on the margins of the insect, when that's in the pupal form, if this is an insect that does something called naked puping. It doesn't form a traditional pupal case that we think of as in many of our other insects. And those saw teeth along the edge of that little naked insect laying there that doesn't really have legs as it's going from the maggot looking thing to the beetle looking stage um, has a toxic chemical in it that you know if somebody comes along and wants to eat it since it doesn't have legs and it can't defend itself it has off this nasty taste well if you take a grain bin of corn and you go to process it into cornmeal and you've had a population of sawtooth grain beetle that was not managed effectively this, these naked pupae with those little saw teeth and that toxic chemical get ground up. And it can turn animal off of the feed. It can make bread that you make out of that, cornmeal, say, um, have a very bad off taste. So animals will go off their feed if the corn has had a high infestation. So this is something that we don't want, a particular is that we don't want to grow and develop within our bins. We want to get right on it and take care of it if we find it in a corn bin. Another odd one that we have that we can get um, in corn, especially in grain that might have a little bit of a moisture issue, can be mealworms. Now, typically, we don't even find the adults. They're really hard to find. Uh, we tend to see the immature stage. That immature stage is one that we more often know as uh, one that we might use to feed if we've got a lizard as a pet or a bird as a pet. Um, we may use it as a fishing bait. But it is an insect that originally comes from corn grain bins. And they do very effective a way of being able to move through the grain mass because the big beetle guy, even though, as you can see in the picture, he's got nice massive muscles on his legs there, it's hard for him to push down into the grain bin. But evolution has worked wonderfully with the immature stage and these little snake-looking beetle larvae allow them to move between the interstitial spaces between the corn kernels and move throughout the grain bin. So this is one that you do not want also to get into your grain mass, especially with corn. The ones that we may get concerned about later this year are the mold feeders that Tom mentioned, the hairy fungus beetle and foreign grain beetle. In corn, of course, these are insects that do not damage the corn specifically. So when we find these insects uh, in a grain bin, we tend to find them in grain bins that have gone out of condition or are in the process of going out of condition. Uh, either they've got a mold problem that's growing, you've had a leakage problem. So there's something going on here about um, that grain, and that's why you'll find these pests. So they're a wonderful early indicator of the grain going out of condition. So you find this, you need to start looking at that grain much, much closer. One that I want to spend a little bit of time on that we haven't spent with the um, other reviews is the idea of the caffer beetle. Now, caffer beetle is one that I hope you never see and that you never get into your grain bin. It's one that is um, a domestic. So typically, you don't find the adults. They're really hard to find. and we don't want it. Um, but the domestic, the 
immature stage are very distinctive. There are larvae that have lots of hairs on them. And when they molt the next larval stage, they throw off that calf skin. And often in facilities which you have any dermestid problem, not the capra beetle in particular, but say any place that has a dermestid issue, is you find these calf skins blowing in the breeze. Um, they're often the way that we will sample this insect is to find those calf skins. Now the capra beetle itself is the only insect that we deal with in post-harvest grain storage that is under um, quarantine status. So this is an insect we do not want to have in the United States. We've had it a few times. We do not want it to come now. The reason I bring this insect up as a concern right now is that the number of incidents that we find of capra beetle is growing. Now, how is that? We don't have the insect, but we're finding incidents of it. We know that the capra beetle itself, if it were to get into the United States and when it shows up, there's a large proportion of the United States that can have the climate suitable for this insect. Now, even though this is a tropical insect, um, you know, we tend to heat places. We tend to have insulation in places. And so this insect will be able to survive even out of the southern part of the United States into parts of the Midwest and the northern part of the U.S. So these are the areas that are in the U.S. that we found that are suitable for it. Where have we found it? Um, we've started looking for this particular insect, and we have found it in many places throughout the Midwest. Um, we have areas where we have not found it. So we've looked and not found it. And those are the green squares that you'll see. But there are places that they're found. Now, where are they typically found when they're not sampling just for general looking at them? They're typically found where we have found them is in airports and ports of call, either shipping ports or airports. To find this particular insect, you have to look very carefully on where it is because the immature stages are very difficult to see. Um, they tend to move around at dark. And they're not easy to find. Where would we want? How can we sample? There are pheromone beta traps that we can use to survey for them. Um, where we're doing surveys now is at major airports and major shipping ports. And that's where the incidents come in. So these insects are flying in on airplanes in people's luggage. Very common. We're finding often uh, more than once or twice a month of coming into Indianapolis Airport. Um, with people coming in, they're coming in through shipping ports along the coast and into ports around Chicago. So just because you live not near a big major shipping port doesn't mean that you may not have a potential for this insect to be found. They, as I said, they're coming into airports because people are more mobile these days. They're bringing in food supplies so people, this insect feeds on lots of different things, rice and corn and uh, dried food products. It also will feed in wood. Uh, so there's a lot of things that it can feed on and a lot of shipping materials that could include this. It's typically found in the area of India and that part of Asia. So anything that's shipped from that area has the potential. We know that the population's there. It's very common in those areas in Southeast Asia. And so the chance of those insects getting on a plane when someone brings in a bag of rice or a souvenir or a drum from Africa, these are potentials for these insects to get in. We do have the way to monitor them. They're capra beetle traps, either the floor traps or wall mounted traps that you can put for capra beetle pheromone and monitor yourself for that. The reason we don't want this insect to get in there, it's very difficult to kill with fumigation. Um, it takes a lot longer fumigation to kill this insect, and it takes a much higher dose. This guy has the ability to shut its spiracles, its breathing apparatus down, and hold its breath for many, many days. It can also wait more than a year. Um, you can't starve it out. It can wait that long for food. So it's a very difficult insect to control, a difficult insect to um, eliminate, and so we do not want it in the U.S. 
The next thing that we want to point out for this year, the storage year, is the issue of mold. Um, molds are not good to get into grain, and we do have a worry with them getting into corn because of the moisture issue associated with drying corn. Um, storage molds can cause a lot of damage because of the heating. They add moisture, they, um, which then adds as the grain is starting to deteriorate, it can heat up. If you're storing it for seed, you can have lots of germination. And of course, just the odor associated with moldy grain is not something that you can lose grade associated with that. Um, with many of the storage molds that we can get, we get the issue of mycotoxins, which are um, regulated by the USDA and FDA. There's many organizations that um, regulate this. And of course, your buyers are going to not be happy if there's mycotoxin in there. So the costs associated with getting mold can be extremely high. Let's go over a few of these just to refresh our memory of what we might have to worry about. The first one is fusarium ear rot and kernel rot. It's one of the most widespread that we can get into corn. Um, it's a pinkish, purplish color typically that you'll find on corn ears typically at the um, tip of the ear because that ear has been damaged by the corn earworms, and that allows this um, ear rot to get in there. It does produce a mycotoxin, which typically can affect horses, swine, and, and humans. The next one is jib ear rot, right? This occurs throughout the corn belt. Uh, it's often more prevalent in northern regions of the Corn Belt, really favored by cool, humid weather, um, especially if you get heavy rain and soaking, and we've had those conditions in some parts of the Midwest. So jib ear rot is one that we are concerned about this year. Um, the symptoms associated with this is this reddish color, again, that starts at the tip, often involved with um, damage because of insects in the field, and this moves on down the uh, ear. Here's an uh, image of what it can look like. It progresses down as the kernel fills, and then the internal ear, entire ear can be affected by jib ear rot. This is not one that you want to get. Jib itself, jib ear rot can produce multiple mycotoxins. Um, some that are really bad and some that we can deal with a little bit easier. Um, Xerolinone is one, or F2 it's often called. It's not good with swine. Um, they really do not do well when you have jib ear rot with uh, xerolinone in them. The big one that is of concern in certain regions of the Midwest this year is probably going to be jib ear rot associated called DON, uh, D-O-N, deoxynivalenol. This is uh, really bad for swine and ruminants. Um, swine is the worst. Um, they really do not do well at all with Dawn. So we need to be really surveying our uh, fields as we're getting ready to harvest. And if we do find uh, some of these ear rot in there that produce mycotoxins, we want to make sure that we separate those fields off and not mix and contaminate all the grain that you're harvesting. A diplodia ear rot is the most common where um, you've done reduced tillage. Um, most of these ear rots are often found um, in the soils, and just as harvest occurs, sometimes this will stir it up. Um, you're getting a whiting of the corn instead of a pink with diplodia. Um, by the time we go into harvest now and in the next month or so, the ears are completely rotted at that point. This particular one, if it's white rather than pink, does not produce a mycotoxin that we need to worry about. The next one is aspergillus ear and kernel rot. Um, this produces a greenish or yellowish tone to the kernels. Um, greatest damage is to the tip also, starting off so it's easy to sample for. And Rather than being one that we're concerned about damaging the corn in the field, this is one where we get very concerned when it moves into the storage facility. So let's look at storage facility next. The storage fungi that we have to worry about typically come from either aspergillus or penicillium. These are commonly found 
all through the soil surface, right? So they're always there. It's whether or not the fungi themselves are, the gene, genes are turned on for it to produce the mycotoxins that we have to worry about in storage. And also, they may always be there, but they may not be growing. There has to be certain environmental conditions for them to take off and start growing. The things that we worry about are warmer temperatures often. Um, temperatures above 40 degrees will allow many of these storage fungi to proliferate and grow. And moisture contents above 13.5%. Certainly anything above 18% is going to be easy for these um, storage fungi to grow and prosper within a grain bin. Uh, for Aspergillus species, produces an aflatoxin um, called, well, a mycotoxin called aflatoxin, all right? The, when moisture contents are high in the air, so when you have high humidities and you have temperatures above 54 degrees, typically that is when you can start getting Aspergillus to produce aflatoxin. So Aspergillus may always be there, but it may not always produce the toxin. That's the difference. This one, the maximum level allowed by FDA is 20 parts per billion. So if you have grain that you may be suspicious as they are harvesting, that grain should be separated out so it does not contaminate everything that goes in to the bin. Penicillium is another one um, that will grow on many different parts of the grain and it will grow on the kernels when they get into the grain bin. As penicillium are able to grow even during cooler weather. So even though you may cool down your grain bin, moisture content will be critical for this because it has to have moisture levels above 16%. So grain that is cool and wet can still have penicillium growing. But if it's cool and dry, you don't have to have to worry about penicillium. Okay. The next one is what contributes to this growth? So it's a combination of both moisture and temperature and then length of storage. Damaged insects also allow that because the insects themselves can generate heat and they can also generate moisture in certain areas where you have a large concentration of insects and then that allows the molds to grow. Fine materials will reduce airflow, which reduces your ability to cool the grain, which means you can have higher temperatures. So these five factors in combination are what will allow molds to grow within a grain bin. Right. The damage that is caused uh, can be the seed germination, caking that we notified or we talked about earlier, heating of the grain, which is not good that we want. Um, as the grain warms, it can allow other molds to grow and then cause other problems. So you can start off with some of the cooler grain, um, mold infesting grains, and then as the grain warms, you'll get some of these other fungi um, taking over and growing. Preventing it is one to prevent infection. Um, so having only clean grain go into the bin. Um, you can't destroy mycotoxin once it's in there. It's in there to stay. You can re reduce the risk of it, but you can't eliminate it. All right? You want to have better grain, so you don't want to have damaged grain, and you want to moderate that moisture and storage conditions. All right? What are the temperatures and the uh, moisture contents that we're talking about? Typically, we say below 15%. Um, if you're going to remove that grain, certainly if you can get it below 13% for corn, it's much, much better. You are not going to have much of an issue with the storage molds, creating molds and mycotoxins, if you can get below 13%. For maximum time of storage, remember, it's a combination of both the moisture content and the temperature. So as temperature rises and moisture count rises, then you have less storage time. You get your maximum storage time for corn by having cooler temperatures and lower moisture content. If you look on this table here, you just get one, just, just pick 15% moisture content, and we go from 40 degrees up to 80 degrees. We go from about 29 days, 
right? 29 months, rather, up to 2.9 months. So you get a significant difference, tenfold difference um, in storage time just by cooling down the grain. And that's why we really emphasize making sure that you cool the grain. Um, as Frank mentioned, aeration is critical, but aeration and temperature um, are linked together. But you do not remove much moisture when you're just aerating. Aeration is designed to change temperature. It can reduce moisture migration. It can manage your mold and insects, but it's not designed to dry grain. Right? You have to have better systems to dry your grain with aeration than you can. And you usually can't get enough moisture, especially with corn, out by just using in-bin aeration. Right? You have to have a special system set up for that. Realizing, of course, how you move that aeration front through is critical. Just because you're moving air doesn't mean you're moving an aeration front. You have to know how powerful your aeration fan is to move that aeration front all the way through so that you don't stop it. The last thing we look at is that temperature on insect mortality. So you're going to get at temperatures about 15 degrees C or 55 degrees Fahrenheit is where you start getting um, aeration to have an effect on insect death. It's not instantaneous. By any means, insects do just fine at temperatures, say, at 50 degrees. But as Tom mentioned, you want to slow down their growth. So you might have insects within a grain bin if you where it had your temperatures at 40 degrees, and they're not necessarily going to die. But they're not, the population isn't going to grow because they're not going to be moving around trying to mate and feed and do damage. Okay. The only way you're going to kill them is to get those temperatures extremely cold and very quickly. Insects can survive freezing. They have the ability to do that. So it's a matter of applying that very quickly. This is how they get through the winter naturally. It's freezing temperatures outside. They can crawl up underneath the bark of trees and down in rodent burrows. And that's how they've survived before we built grain bins. So we need to get it cool as quickly as we can, and we need to maintain that cool for the entire grain mass, making sure that we get that aeration front all the way through, and that we have dry grain going in. And you'll have less problems with insects and less problems with mold. Any questions on that? I want to relate to you again the temperatures that you're looking. You can kill with. Cold, you can kill with heat, um, but you've got to be able to get the temperature to the insect and maintain it. And it depends if the insect has been preconditioned, as in the fall they are. And that's why we can't necessarily kill as quickly with those temperatures that we might say it's freezing. The insect has adapted to those temperatures to survive them. Any questions? All right, then I think we're ready to go on. Yep, I don't think anybody else has got any more questions. We'll just give it one second in case anybody else wants to type anything in, and then we'll move on to one last talk from Tom Phillips.